Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. I thought today we'll go over a topic which has been quite popular over the last few weeks once again because people are bored and for some reason when people are bored and there's no new content in War Thunder we go back to some of the oldest ideas or discussions in the book which are all ridiculous and silly. This is one of them. The idea itself is historical matchmaking. Now, when it comes to this video, we're going to go through several different things, uh, which hopefully will knock every single idea on the head. The only one I'm not really going to touch is the immersion one, because unfortunately, if you chat about the immersion one, it's completely and utterly subjective to the individual. So it is a useless talking point, because it's it's a he said, said she, she said, uh, you know, idea. It's not based on factual things, it's based on feelings, therefore can't be really reasoned with. So what we're going to do is go through a bunch of arguments and also go through why historical matchmaking is one of the dumbest things in the world to want in a video game which wants to at any point be balanced or you know even have a semblance of balance. Let's get started. So the first point that a lot of people bring up is the idea of putting a barrier between Cold War and Second World War vehicles. The only people who really believe this uh, very much focus on the major nations in the game and also mainly focus on America. The reason for this is because if you read anything about American history uh, when it comes to ground or when it comes to aviation, there was a fundamental shift in policy and ideas in America um, when the Second World War ended. They completely finished uh, or cancelled a bunch of their projects they were working on and had complete new visions on what they wanted to create new. The USSR kind of did this too. Germans obviously weren't really in the mood for it because they just lost. Japan also wasn't really in the mood for it either because they just lost. And Britain, in some ways, was very revolutionary, like the Centurion. But in others, such as some of their aircraft they produced, not so revolutionary until even the lightning came out. And so with certain countries, you see a big shift from World War II to Cold War vehicles, which is why people like to bring up the idea of putting a barrier there. The problem is, that's not every country, and also at the same time, that's very biased and very prejudiced uh, towards certain countries over others, and also is advocating for segregation, which for me is not really a great thing. Uh, so, looking at the idea of Cold War to World War II vehicles, we have a bunch of different examples we can go through which kind of show how stupid this idea is, how there is a defined barrier between these vehicles. And usually what ends up happening is a lot of people who have Second World War tanks, they get killed by some heat shells or they get killed by ATGMs and they scream wah and that's not fair, even though their tanks can easily kill the enemy's tanks. Uh, but, you know, it's still unfair because he fired the big missile at me. So let's, first of all, look at the most concrete example of why putting a barrier there is one of the stupidest things you can ever do. And it's called the Swedish Wake Up Call. This was coined by Alex, one of my mates, and it is a perfect example of how ridiculous it is uh, having a kind of World War II Cold War barrier. Because guess what? Different nations have different doctrines and also different, uh, different like uh, ranges of technological development. And Sweden was one of those which was behind for a very long time. Their World War II stuff is very, very limited. Most of it is, you know, at rank one, uh, if you want to have a look at it in the tech tree. At rank two, three, and four, you have some examples of vehicles which are completely all over the place when it comes to their BR and where they should be technically historically. Examples of this are the PVKV-3, the PVKV-2, the IKV-103, the SAV M43 1946, uh, the PVKV M43 1963. So let's go through all of these vehicles and kind of show you what I mean. The first one being the SAV M43 1946. This is a one. This is a vehicle which has a 105 millimeter gun. Uh, it fires heat. It pens 240 millimeters. You know, crazy at the BR that it uh, that it is. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, 3.0. It can pen anything that it it faces. It's also a very slow truck built on a chassis which was designed pre-World War II, but don't, don't worry about that. And this vehicle was, uh, they started modifying the 75mm versions of them into 105s 
into 1946. This thing was used until the early 70s. So technically, this vehicle being birthed in 1946 and going into the 70s is a Cold War vehicle. It is at 3.0, and if it went any higher, it would be completely useless when it comes to the game. If you put this against Cold War vehicles, like the T-54, the Centurion, which we'll get into in a second, or many others, it will get annihilated. Uh, you know, it just wouldn't be very fun at all. Then the next one is the PVKV M43 1946. Now, um, we just uh, had a chat about this one, but at the same time, this one uh, has the slightly longer barreled gun. You know, it has the good old 75mm. Uh, uh, this uh, vehicle could actually not do too bad against Cold War vehicles because it has the APDS, but the main issue with it is it's still on a terrible platform and still uh, would be very easy to kill. It's also at 4.0, so it mainly faces Second World War vehicles from other nations. If you put this thing once again up against T-54s, M46s, M47s, it would just get annihilated and it wouldn't even be funny. This thing should technically fight IS-3s. Good luck with that. That. Nobody wants to do that. This is once again a 1946 vehicle. This is a post-World War II vehicle. The next one that we'll have a look at is even more egregious. This one is the PVKV M43 1963. This was from the 60s, you know, the M60s, the T64. That era of vehicle from 77 to like 90. The PVKV M43 is from that era and it is at 50. And the reason is, is because it's trash and it's built off ideas from the second world war but it it was developed and built in the 60s you know it's it has a updated gun it has you know a roof on it but it's still a 1960s vehicle which is just insane then you've got the ikv 103 which this kind of goes to the whole doctrinal thing where because things were designed for different doctrinal reasons, you can't uh, you can't expect them to be able to go up against uh, different vehicles of their same era. The IKV-103 is another Cold War vehicle. You know, it was at least uh, thought about in 1949. But this version, uh, basically in 1952, a cannon-equipped version under the designation IKV-72 was put into service. The modification of this was the IKV-102, and then the IKV-103 came around in the 50s. Okay, this is a 1950s vehicle, and it served until the mid-70s. So once again, T-64s, T-72s, M-60s, all of that gaff it, this thing would face. And the only thing it has going for it is a heat shell. And I'm very sick of people using the argument that because it has a really nice high penning round, it needs to go up in VR. It's a stupid argument, especially since the rest of the vehicle is completely crap. The PVKV2 is a vehicle from the early 50s. The PVKV3 was built at the same time as it because Sweden was looking to upgun all of their different uh, ideas and create a bunch of prototypes at the same time. And that's where the PVKV2 and 3 and 1 and 4 came from, which we'll see. They're all early 50s. 50s vehicles so they're all cold war vehicles once again enjoy facing t-54s in these things you won't be able to do anything against them and they'll look at you and just kill you same with facing other stuff and then the crown of the cake of the swedish wake-up call it is the panzerbandwagen 301 this is technically the first ifv to ever exist it was at 2.3 in the game still is and this vehicle was in service in 1961 and all it is is a little basic you know carrier of infantry which has access to a 20 millimeter auto cannon are you telling me you want this to go up against 1950s mbts are you really that sadistic not even 1950s mbts you want this to go up against 1960s mbts are you crazy are you are you mad and this is why it is called the Swedish wake-up call. Because Sweden, as a nation nowadays, in the modern era, is very advanced when it comes to its aviation and when it comes to its ground forces. But in the mid-21st century, they were not. 
They were quite behind because of doctrinal stuff and also because of some other factors. But is are you insane that you want vehicles like this going up against their historical counterparts? And you don't want them going up against World War II vehicles, which they would fit a lot better at. It is just completely insane when you think about it on a general level. Another point that I forgot to emphasize was the Centurion. So the Centurion Mark III was first produced in 1948, and it overtook the previous Mark I and Mark II in service. So this was produced before the vast majority of vehicles that I've actually mentioned here for Sweden. Imagine all of those vehicles being a higher BR than the Centurion Mark III. The other simple fact is war, as an idea, is inherently imbalanced. And the reason for this is because both sides are trying their best to win. And because both sides are trying their best to win, they usually have technological advancements. And if one side is much bigger than the other, or one side has a lot more technological advancements than the other one, generally the other side loses. If you want a classic example of this, of course, the Gulf War, or, you know, uh, specifically Operation Desert Storm. You can have a look at how the Americans and their allies completely dismantled the Iraqis. It wasn't even close when it comes to what ended up happening in the Gulf War. You should have a look at the statistics on that and also have a look at what the Iraqis were using compared to what the Americans were using, and then vice versa. And you will see the technological difference between the two nations. Even during the Second World War, when you had technological advancements for the British in the forms of the radar that they were using, uh, even stuff such as their engine builds, such as the Merlin or the Griffin engine, which were fantastic compared to some of their competition, even better than some of the American designs at the time. And you can see during the Second Second World War even, you have little increments of technology which um, basically put one side above the other, depending on you know what, uh, what you generally look at. And because of this, that means even during the Second World War, that many people want to hold you know, dearly, even there you have technological advancements which would destroy the idea of historical matchmaking. Just like how we talk about the idea of, you know, T-3485s 30, facing Tiger 2Hs on, you know, an equal footing, you know, stuff like that. Or even an IS-3 versus a Panther D. Vehicles like this um, should be able to see each other technically. Uh, so you have these horrible setups uh, where because one nation has, you know, gone forward and the other one has not, then what ends up happening is you have a really tough time. And just to give you some examples of this from the aviation point of view, um, so uh, just, to, just to kind of give you an example, a Second World War example, at the end of the war, the Bearcats, the F-8F, this was in squadrons in the naval side of things, uh, on carriers to be able to be used. Now, the war ended too soon, same happened with the Tiger Cats, but you know one thing that did fly missions in Italy during the Second World War? The P-80, specifically the P-80 prototypes, which were very close to the P-80A or the F-80A as it's known in the game right now. So we have that vehicle and it's very close to the one which flew in World War II. You also have the Meteors, by the way. They are Second World War aircraft, ME-262s, of course, which go around the place, and then also some other vehicles, which are Second World War, which you wouldn't believe are Second World War. Now, these are quite heavy technological advancements and generally would blow most vehicles out of the water if you uh, put them up against them. It would just not be fair when you have a look at it. The B-29, for example, is one of those which we could bring up looking at Second World War stuff and how it would be not, once again, fair to be able to put up against stuff. So you've got to realize that even in times of conflict, the both sides are not equal. And if that's the case, if you then transport that into a video game and also get rid of all the logistical elements that are involved and also the policy elements and the doctrine elements, 
you are also inherently not going to create a balanced experience. It is not going to happen, you're going to have everybody playing one side. And you know how I know this? Because one of the ways of actually creating these historical things, which some people do, by the way, is to create custom battles and use emissions around these ideas. You know, you can limit the amount of vehicles that uh, come in and you can, you know, make the maps to how you want. You can recreate these historical scenarios and play them out. And what ends up happening is everybody wants to play one side because it is obvious which side is going to do really well. If you put stuff like M1A1s and Bradleys versus BMP1s and T72s, guess, or T72As, guess who everybody wants to play? It isn't the T72As. And this is the problem with historical matchmaking in general. You will have one side be dominant. We have a, a World War II uh, Chronicles event, which proved this, even when Gaijin created a event which was basically completely around historical matchmaking, what ended up happening is everybody played one side. It didn't work. It was horrific because you would wait in queues for, you know, 10, 20 minutes because nobody wanted to play the side which would lose over and over again, which is why that event got removed and why also World War Mode is a mess because one side is inherently more powerful than the other one, even if you make them as balanced as possible. Like, we have several examples, even in the game of historical matchmaking, not working because you are running from a presumption that everybody will want to play everything, which is not what happens in this game and doesn't even happen today with a historical matchmaking, where the vast majority of people favor certain nations over others. You also have the issue of picking which level of historical accuracy you want. And this one is the real kicker, because this one is the one that confused all of the arguments, uh, which is always super fun. So what date do you want to use for vehicles? Do you want to use when they entered service? Do you want to use their first drive or their first flight? Do you want to use when the first prototype was, uh, was created? Because all of these will have different dates, and all of these will be different depending on the vehicles. Some vehicles are tested in the 50s and only put into service in the 60s. Some vehicles are tested in the 80s and only come into service in the 2000s. Some, some vehicles are shown in the 60s and only become available in the 80s. So which date works? Which date do you actually want to pick? Because if you end up picking uh, the wrong date, or if you end up picking any of the dates as a standard, e.g. first flight, or prototype built, or entered service, there will still be a ton of examples where this just doesn't work very well. Like, I can give you several examples. We could go a whole video just discussing the different issues uh, when coming with that, because it goes back to, once again, different countries have different technological advancements and also different beliefs when it comes to building these things. So which is it? Which, which, uh, which criteria do you pick? You know, instead of just picking the ambiguous, I want X vehicles, not face Y vehicles. You need to think deeper than this, because unfortunately, you're going to be filled with contradictions. And if the contradictions aren't answered, then nothing makes sense, and it is a completely useless argument, which is what it is right now. You also have the factor of different nations using the same vehicle at different times e.g. the F-100s, you know, the, the Americans used the F-100s before the Taiwanese did. Then also you have all the different F-104 variants, uh, which were, you know, added to different countries. You had all of the Phantoms as well, which are present in different countries. They all entered service at different times. They're all different variants. So do they fight each other? Should they fight each other? Or should we should we go off their dates? You know, should we should we enter that? How about stuff like the the World War Two vehicles? So stuff like the Shermans. You know, the Japanese got their Shermans post World War Two. Uh, you know, so the Italians did with their American vehicles after the armistice. So what do we do with those? Because obviously they got them after the they were developed by the Americans. 
right? And in service with the Americans. So do we do we do we put it on the Americans' head on when they entered service? Do we just put them there? Do we do it on the countries and when they use them specifically? What do you do with prototypes because they never entered service? Do you go off the prototype date and when you know they were built and tested? Okay, so you have to do that with all of the other vehicles as well. And if you do that with all the other vehicles, you're going to have some absolutely insane ones. And what if a vehicle is different from its prototype to its production one in a significant way? Then what do you do? What do you do with a vehicle that doesn't have a prototype? And it just is pushed into service, like a ton of vehicles from the uh, early 50s uh, in Britain, when it comes to their planes, a lot of them were pushed into service incredibly quickly um, because, you know, they had a gap there because they were waiting on the lightning. So what do you do with those, right? What do you do with all of these vehicles? I don't know. Because, as I said, historical matchmaking is stupid. And if you start actually thinking about it and breaking it apart even just in a little bit, it falls apart very quickly and none of these questions are answered. One of the things that has to be squashed, which keeps going around all of the time in War Thunder, is the idea that War Thunder started as a World War II game, and therefore that should be preserved. War Thunder did not start as a World War II game. I don't know where this idea came from. I don't know if it's just parroted by people who just weren't around at the time, or what went on, but it is not a World War II game. Let's do a bit of a history lesson. So, War Thunder is based off Wings of Prey. Now, Wings of Prey is a World War II game. It only has Second World War vehicles. It only has uh, missions which are based around the Second World War. If you actually want to have a look at a lot of the Wings of Prey content, you can find it in the single missions and dynamic campaign missions that are in War Thunder. That's one of the major reasons why those actually exist in the game is because they were from Wings of Prey. But War Thunder is not Wings of Prey. War Thunder was released into open beta um, on the 28th of January 2013. So that's when it was available for everybody. And I was there, basically. <laughs> and when, when it comes to the 28th of January 2013, what you had in it at launch, so when this was, it was available to everybody, so after CBT, uh, when the game was about. Remember, there was only aircraft in the game back then. There was no ground vehicles, there was no naval vehicles, there was only airplanes. But do you know what was there? The F-86A5. The F-86A5 was introduced into War Thunder since the game started in open beta prior to update 2.7. This vehicle was in the game before the release of the open beta of the game. The F-86 A5, the NA-151, the one that we have in game, was the first real combat saber. It had access to the J-47 GE-7 engine. That was produced for the first time on the 23rd of February, 1949. This thing is a post-World War II vehicle. It was in the game after or before the game was released. This means that War Thunder was never a World War II game. Another concrete example as well is of course the MiG-15 BIS, its competitor. Now the MiG-15 BIS was actually added before the MiG-15, weirdly enough. Uh, the MiG-15 was added in one of the updates 1.3 uh, setups, but the MiG-15 BIS was added prior once again to update 1.27 which was when War Thunder went into open beta. So the top dogs in the game at that time were the MiG-15 BIS and the F-86A5. The MiG-15 BIS is a later development of the MiG-15. It had a new engine, it had armament changes, it had overall improvements, and this started its life from 1950. So the idea that War Thunder has ever just been a World War II game is a lie because you have vehicles in it, even from the start of its existence, which were post-World War II. I really wish people would stop parroting this rubbish. So now we'll go through some examples of some ridiculous ideas uh, when it comes to balancing vehicles by era, 
or balancing them by year. Now, some of these are actually pretty close in the game uh, when you actually think about uh, when they're from. And, you know, a lot of people have argued that because these are close, the BR decompression is not, you know, not good. You know, that it needs to be spread out a bit more. So, you know, you have two kind of countering ideas here uh, when it goes forward. But just to give you some little tidbits of information. So as we talked about before, the P-80 prototypes first flew missions in Italy in the Second World War. Kind of nuts, right? How about the F-14? Well, the F-14, its first missions were actually on the last day of the Vietnam War during the evacuation from Saigon. So the F-14 is a Vietnam era aircraft, <laughs> if, you, if you want to put it there, which is absolutely nuts. Some other examples uh, when it comes to American vehicles. So the F-86, as we talked about before, 1949. The F-100A, 1953 to 1954. The F-104A, 1958, but it actually first flew in 1954. And then the F-11F, which first flew in 1945, but it was introduced into service in 1956. So depending on which which date you want to pick for the F-11F, it's screwed either way. If you put it at 1945, so facing stuff like ME-262s, it's going to annihilate everything. If you put it in 1956, it's going to be facing what is currently 10 O's and 10 3's in our game right now, which would not be great. And just to give you a parallel, right? So remember, F-100A, 1953, F-104A, 1958, F-11F, 1956. Okay, that's when they were introduced into service. Whereas the F-104A first flew in 1954, F-11F first flew in 1945. To give you a counter, the British, the Supermarine Scimitar, currently at 87, first flew in, or introduced, sorry, 1957. The Javelin, 1956, and then the Supermarine Swift, 1954. So all of these vehicles, which are 8387, are comparable to 971001s when it comes to the American tech tree and even 103s. So you can see how just looking at this very simple example, how this idea does not match up when it comes to what these things should be fighting. I don't think a scimitar is more advanced and therefore should fight stuff which is from 1957 because the scimitar was a piece of crap where 50% of them unfortunately crashed because of an inherent flaws in its design. And pilots absolutely hated this. The Javelin as well, being in 1956. Do you want that to face F-104 A's? I don't think you do. Nobody wants that. So what a asinine argument it is to be able to try and force it. Then also the M-51, a vehicle that was produced in 1960. This vehicle has one thing going for it. It is a heat shell from the 105. Everything else on it is pretty mediocre or bad. Now, uh, the 1960s saw a lot of vehicles. You know, the M60, the T62, the uh, stuff such as, you know, the T64 was at least developed in that era. And also, uh, you have some other vehicles as well. Uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, the ways that people push forward, stuff like the Chieftains were starting to come around, you know, obviously the Centurions, the high-end ones. I don't want the M51 to face any of them because it would just get annihilated. It wouldn't even be funny to watch it just get just absolutely donked on. And then we have our second wake-up call. This is the Chinese wake-up call now. And this is actually in reference to their aviation stuff. We could have done a Swedish wake-up call when it comes to their aviation as well, by the way, because there's a lot of vehicles which, once again, were way past their sell-by date even when they were entering service for Sweden. But for China, you have the J7 and the J8. These are the top vehicles when it comes to uh, China right now, okay? Now, the J7E was first shown off to the public in 1987. But at the same time, it started replacing the J7Bs in the mid-1990s. So this thing is a mid-1990s vehicle, the J7E. The J8B, its prototype was in 1984, right? It was approved to enter service in 1988, right? So these vehicles, the J8 and the J7 for China, are mid-90s 
and also late 80s vehicles. The MiG-23 MLD, that's also from 1982, right? So the once again, an 80s vehicle. You know what's way before them? So first of all, the Mitsubishi F1. The Mitsubishi F1 was from 1978, okay? Now, the F-14. Guess when the F-14 was from? You know, the vehicle which we have, which is taking over the game right now, making MiG-23 players run and be scared with their pants around their ankles, the J-8Bs, you know, tossing and turning at night, the J-7Es doing the same thing, rolling off the bed. 1974. The F-14 was out 20 years before the J-7E. It was out four years before the Mitsubishi F-1. It also was eight years before the MiG-23 MLD. So technically, the F-14, if you wanted to go by historical matchmaking, should be an even lower BR than it is right now. And anybody who wants to argue that is legitimately insane. A simple fact is also something else which may be worth bringing up. One of the things which I find a lot when it comes to War Thunder is people believing that certain things are overpowered because they face them a lot and don't play them themselves. What should be focused on in scenarios like that is pushing forward to be able to play those vehicles. If you think the BMP is really imbalanced versus Tiger 2s, Go play the BMP. Go let me know how you think of it. How about the Zaklam Tega, a vehicle which is at 6.7 right now? Do you think that should be historically matchmaking? Do you think that thing is a good idea? How about the AMX-13 SS-11? How about something just like the AMX-13 or the AMX-1390? What about the M51? You know, what about the Type 60 ATM? What about the M113A1 Toes? All of these vehicles, how about you sit down and play them and tell me that they should all go up in BR because they are facing, you know, vehicles which are from the era of World War II and that is not fair. Please enlighten me on how those vehicles feel. As a person who spaded all of them, I can tell you a lot of them feel absolutely garbage and that is why they're at the BR that they're at and also why they will probably never go up in BR. Apart from the AMX-13, that one's pretty fun. And the last one, which is also incredibly important, which always gets brushed aside because, not, not because, you know, not enough people play it, but because of the fact that it destroys the narrative, is of course Naval. Naval is a game mode which always gets underrepresented when it comes to pretty much anything. And I don't think it should. It's actually not a bad game mode. There are certain aspects I don't like, but overall, you know, it's not too bad. The coastal stuff I really enjoy, the early blue water stuff I enjoy, the later stuff is a bit boring to me, but I understand why people like it. It's nice to see the player base of Naval, which has increased over the last few years. It's lovely to see it actually, you know, grow over time. Now, Naval is a concrete example of why historical matchmaking is very, very stupid. Because different nations had different doctrines and also had different ideas at many different times and also built a bunch of machines from, uh, you know, uh, from different eras which were for different roles. The Orla, for example, uh, the Irish machine, uh, which is based off of the Peacock, the Peacock being a 1980s vehicle, by the way, the Orla has just left service, I believe, or just been retired from Irish service. It is a 90s or early 2000s vehicle. And then you have all of the World War I battleships at the highest BR of the game, uh, because guess what? They're incredibly strong. And also, if you put them up against their competition, uh, you know, World War I PT boats or, <laughs> or uh, you know, destroyers, they would just annihilate them. You have heavy cruisers uh, from World War II, which are lower BR than those battleships, and the battleships are still annihilating them because naval history doesn't care about, you know, naval history doesn't care about your historical matchmaking. What they care about is making the biggest boats and making the biggest guns and making the biggest armor. So there's a bunch of vehicles 
which you would have to teeter around with with historical matchmaking when it comes to naval, and you'd find out that most of the highest BRs are filled with frigates from the Soviets and also patrol boats uh, from other nations, which would be great apart from the fact that it would annihilate the mid-tiers because everybody would just play the battleships and destroy everything that is around. It would not be very fun, especially when you put a bunch of 1930s destroyers versus 1916 battleships. They would just get annihilated. So overall, naval is something that should always be brought up in these discussions because it is a fantastic example of why historical matchmaking does not work and will never work and just kind of emphasizes or explodes the ideas that we've talked about before when it comes to policy changes, uh, doctrinal changes, and also how different nations are at a different point um, historically and technologically. Technically, the Dreadnought should be one of the lowest BR machines in the game if you want to be pedantic uh, and good luck fighting that in absolutely anything. I hope this video has explained pretty much everything that it needs to. If you have any further questions, make sure to ask them. If you have or you need more clarifications, obviously ask them as well. But I hope I've made the case on here why historical matchmaking is an incredibly stupid idea. It's one of those things that would never work, it would need so many contradictions or so many complications in it, and it would create so many different vehicles that would be played and nothing else around the BR bracket being played either. Everybody would just play the best thing and not touch anything else. And generally, that's not too fun to do. If you want to do historical matchmaking, you're going to have to take into account logistics. Good luck with that. Um, that would be a pain and it would be one of the things that would be horrific to do. For all the people who want immersive or historic experiences, create user missions, create custom games. All of these are available when it comes to War Thunder. You can create the scenarios that you want to play. So just do it. You know, listen to Shia LaBeouf. Just do it. As always, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Nicholas Richardson, Elove Goat, Pyman675, Winter Scientist, Merciless Reaper, Jerry Prevolt, Megadino King, Orange Tail, Teddy, John Ryman, Universe A, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Moxie, B. Young, Uncle Bean, Sem Arslan, Derek R., Bereen, Lafouche, and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.